Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of The Depot Dive. I'm your host, Ross McCorkle, and above me here on the screen, as always, Joe Clark. Joe, how are you doing today? Pretty good. Pretty good. Excited for the uh, NBA Finals tonight. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The, the, so what is the... Uh, I'm not a huge NBA guy. What's the what's the score? Or what's the series score right now? Uh, game one's tonight, so... Oh, so okay. Cool. Nice. Kicking things off. Awesome. Well, good luck to your Celtics there. Um, when was the last time they won uh, NBA Finals? 2000, 2008. Dang. So, yeah. All right. Well, yeah, best of luck to them. I think we're going to hop right into our topics because uh, we have an unusually packed agenda here today. A lot of kind of big Steelers related uh, topics to dive into. And kind of first and foremost, at the top of this week, uh, Cameron Hayward, who was on a very short holdout, uh, really only lasted for the first two weeks of OTA practices. He missed six practices. And I don't know if did we see that he was at Kennywood on Monday, or did he just return for Tuesday? Uh, we, I don't think we saw any pictures of him if he was at Kennywood. I wouldn't be surprised if he just returned to get back on Tuesday and yeah. join the team at the facility. Yeah, so he, he basically missed the first, uh, that would have been, I guess, seven sessions, including Kennywood, of, of the 10 uh, voluntary OTAs. And he, he returned uh, for Tuesday and is finishing out this week, and he basically you know, said that he, he plans on being at both mandatory mini camp and training camp. It remains to be seen if, you know, he, he kind of alluded to, I'm not sure what my workload will be. So we're not sure if there's going to be kind of a hold in situation, but, uh, regardless, he will be in attendance and kind of acting as that team captain that he's been for, I think I looked and he's been the team captain since something like 2015 or 2016 for every season since then. And so, uh, kind of filling that role and, uh back at practice making sure that he's he's working with some of the young guys along the defensive line and so that's definitely a positive what is kind of your initial i guess reaction to him returning like uh, does it make sense to you that he would return at this point in time it kind of seems odd to have just a two-week holdout what was he hoping to accomplish what are your thoughts yeah i was a little surprised that he came back i mean he's only getting two days of work in and even like his today he's said he had the walter payton man of the year event so he's really only there practicing on tuesday and wednesday getting in whatever work he can which hey it's great he's back he's with his teammates um obviously i think it's great that he's back it just the timing's a little bit confusing if his whole thing is oh i'm gonna sit out to make a point to try to get a new contract extension which hey good he deserves it um it just, I think the timing's a little bit weird, but with mandatory minicamp next week, um, it it does kind of make some sense. Maybe get, get get his legs under him a little bit, get get some work in and get ready for that workload with minicamp coming up, which obviously that's mandatory. He's not sitting that out. He's not getting fined uh, for missing that. So uh, I guess it does make sense maybe for him to come and just get some work in ahead of that. But yeah, the timing is a little bit confusing, uh, but uh, always great to have Cam back. Yeah, and I remember on the Terrible Podcast, uh, I forget what episode that would have been when we were on, uh, when Dave was out of town, but you kind of called your shot with Hayward signing, I forget what date, but it was basically right before minicamp started. So. Yeah, that doesn't that doesn't look all that likely now, though. It doesn't seem like they're, they're all that close, and I think it could drag into, you know, training camp, but I don't know, that was, that was, that was probably just some wishful thinking at the time, hoping that they just wrap things up and you know, get it uh, tightly, neat, neatly wrapped bow and get it out of the way with the Hayward stuff. But uh, I think it's going to drag on into the summer at this point. Yeah, I think, I mean, you're not alone in that thinking. I think Mark Caballi on the fan yesterday, the, the Athletics Steelers insider there, talked about Hayward's contract, and he said it could be coming sooner than people think. And he was kind of thinking roughly along the same lines of what you were, that there's a possibility it could get done prior to minicamp. But in Hayward's own words, he was basically like, you know, there's nothing imminent, I'll put it that way. Um, so it sounds like there's still some work to be done on, in, on the terms of, of that contract. And the terms of the contract, I mean, he, uh, he said it clear as day. He thinks he's still a top five player at his position in the league. And you know, certainly prior to last season, that was that was definitely the case. Uh, so the million dollar question is whether or not he can return to that form of being a top five guy to warrant that kind of contract. And so it'll be very interesting to see how that plays out. Do you have any interesting takes on him saying he's a top five player? Do you agree or do you where are you at on that? I mean, I think he is when he's healthy. 
Uh, I think last season, given I mean, given his age and his health, I think it's going to be tough for him to probably get a contract that pays him, you know, beyond this year as a top five guy as an interior defense alignment. Uh, I don't think we're going to see a lot of guarantees beyond 2024, just given, you know, his age and the fact that he is coming off. He's had multiple surgeries for that core muscle injury. Um, but I think when he's healthy, yeah, he's definitely right around a top five interior defense lineman, even, you know, at 35 years old now. He's, I mean, his strength is otherworldly, his bull rush, his long arm, um, and how he is as a run defender. He's super talented. So um, I don't think that's really that outlandish of a take, but I think getting paid as a top five player is just going to be difficult given the circumstances surrounding. Uh, his contract and you know what what given that he's old and coming off that injury so it'll be interesting to see kind of how the Steelers mitigate that he clearly seems to want to be paid like a top five player but it might not make sense for the team to pay him as one especially with everything going on yeah and in terms of just leverage that that Hayward has I mean he's under contract obviously for this season he's not gonna I can't see him holding out entirely like if we get to the season start and he hasn't signed a new contract, he's not going to sit out. I mean, he he's a guy who, as he said, he wanted to be back for the team because he's a captain. On top of that, he's very much on the cusp of a Hall of Fame career. I don't know if he would make it uh, if he retired today. He might, you know, eventually sometime down the line make it, but it would it would be a long time, if ever, at this point if he retired um, and, and so, you know, sitting out a season at this age, that's very harmful to a potential Hall of Fame case. And, you know, I think that him wanting to play three more seasons is somewhat, at least directly related to his, you know, aspirations to end up in the Hall of Fame. You know, he wants those three more seasons. He hopes they're in Pittsburgh. Um, you know, he has, he has kids, he has his foundation, the Hayward house, he works in the community a lot. He doesn't want to leave. And so that's why he's trying to get locked up because he wants those three more seasons. He wants to make the hall of fame. He's made that clear in the past. And, and so, you know, he's trying to do whatever he can to make sure that that is in Pittsburgh and he doesn't need to uproot his life. And so, you know, you can't fault him for that, but I, I do wonder in terms of leverage, you know, why wouldn't the Steelers just let this thing roll into the season and then make a decision on his contract next off season? Just because I really can't see him holding out. Um, I mean, do, are you in? A, is that are you in agreement um, there? I mean, that would be the. I think that would be you know the smart thing to do in a, an ideal world, but I think it would stand to piss off Hayward if the Steelers let him go into the season on a new contract when he's been so vocal about wanting to get paid and getting it done. And their whole thing is they like to get things done a year ahead of time. And then he also, you know, he give him some more, give him some new money for 2024 and maybe reduce that cap hit a little bit. So that would be one reason why, if, I mean, on the Steelers and maybe why they might be motivated to get it done um, now instead of after the season, just to lower that 2024 cap hit. But um, yeah, I mean, I think given the injury and the age, I think it would make sense for the team to want to see how he looks against, you know, real competition heading into the season before they commit to him longer term. But um, you can, I think you can give him some new money now, more guarantee, reduce that cap hit. And then, yeah, I think he can kind of go light on the guarantees for the next two years, um, if any at all, really. Uh, and, you know, give him, still give him that three-year security, give him the base. But it's going to be interesting to see because I, he really wants a new contract and the Steelers, Right now, it doesn't seem that there's any real urgency to get anything done. So the longer this thing drags out, I think the more likely we'll see maybe, I mean, if we get into mid-August without a new deal, then at that point, I think maybe we start thinking about um, this thing going into the season and the Steelers dealing with it after the 2024 season. And it'll be very interesting to see, you know, how that affects Hayward's mindset and his attitude towards wanting to return to the team and finishing his career with the team. Yeah, I just think he's worth more to Pittsburgh than he is to any other team. And, you know, I think they probably know he is wanting to stay in Pittsburgh for all the reasons that I listed. And he's made it clear he wants to stay in Pittsburgh. I mean, he did kind of make a passing comment saying, you know, if I don't receive the contract, I'm not going to hang up my cleats. So without saying it, he was basically saying, you know, maybe he's willing to possibly play for another team if that's what it takes to play three more seasons. And so... Yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know where I'm at. I've kind of been bouncing back and forth on on what I think the team's going to do. Right now, I kind of am leaning towards what is the real urgency to do it prior to the season. 
there's just so much more protection if you wait and see. You know, if he really can bounce back, then yeah, go ahead and give him that new contract. I think he'll want to return just for for all the reasons we've talked about. So, um, moving into the next topic, uh, Cam Sutton. This is a kind of interesting hot button topic. A lot of people wanted to see him signed, and you know, there's a lot of people that don't want that kind of you know off field stuff involved with the team and i you know i kind of get both sides of it it's a little tricky of a situation he obviously had the uh, uh i guess you'd say alleged uh, domestic violence situation it's been reduced to a misdemeanor it was a felony at first he was on the run from the police for i think almost 2 weeks if not a full 2 weeks and so a uh, little little rough uh, to to bring him back, but there's no doubt that it will complete the secondary in a way that, you know, I don't know how else they were going to get that if they brought back Patrick Peterson. You know, I don't really know if that was going to be the needle mover that, that bringing back Sutton uh, has the potential to be for them. And so I mean, where where do you come in with this stuff? I mean, a lot of people are pretty upset with the signing overall. Yeah, I mean, on the field, he's definitely an upgrade in the secondary. He can play the slot. He's got that versatility to kind of move around to. But the Steelers didn't really have a reliable option at slot cornerback. Well, now they have Cameron Sutton, who's played in the slot and succeeded in the slot with them. So on the field, I think he's going to play a big role when, you know, he's actually on the field because I think he's probably facing a suspension. Um, but, I, yeah, he makes them better on the field. But, God, listening to him yesterday was just a disaster class and how not to handle the situation. Like, uh, it was just so frustrating to hear him talk about, you know, adversity and narratives and like, dude, like you, you were on the run from the police for two weeks after you allegedly, you know, strangled your girlfriend and not and made her unconscious. Like, it, well, what's the adver- like everybody goes through adversity. There's no narratives or adversity being created here. Like, I, I don't know how he doesn't have like somebody in his ear telling him like, hey, man, he probably shouldn't be saying this right now. It was just painful to listen to. And it honestly really pissed me off because it's like, did it seem like he didn't really care about the situation at all? Like, didn't seem to show any remorse or just, oh, I'm going to put my best foot forward and, you know, deal with the adversity. Like, come on, man. Like, it was, it was, it was painful to listen to him yesterday. And I hope we don't have to hear much from him more for the rest of the offseason, but I'm sure we will. Yeah. And what the team will have to address it at some point, you know, the next time that, that, uh, that, you know, Con and or Tomlin are put in front of the the media. That's going to be an uh, you know reviving that talking point and and all that. And so, uh, you know, I mean, they obviously know him better than anybody. He spent I think six seasons in Pittsburgh. Five or was it five or six? I think it was six seasons. Was six. Yeah, in Pittsburgh. And so, um, you know, they know the kind of guy he is, and they know if maybe this was, I mean kind of out of character or whatever it is it's hard to kind of justify you know i'm kind of trying to jump over hoops to justify this for them but it is tough to kind of uh come to peace with uh, them doing something like this especially after the lions were very quick to cut bait on the situation it's not the best look overall but um there is no doubt in terms of the on-field stuff that he will fill a big need uh, he kind of played a mixture of in the slot and out wide for the Steelers towards the end of his tenure here last time. And I think he's probably a shoe in to be in that slot position role, especially given that they don't really have anybody else. They have, you know, a bunch of question marks and they did just sign Graylin Arnold, uh, that, that we'll talk about here in just a little bit. But, um, you know, in terms of, in terms of filling in that slot spot, he's going to be a big upgrade for the Steelers. He had he has since drafted in 2017, he has 44 passes defense, which is 23rd at the cornerback position since 2017. And so, you know, this is a guy that has good ball production. This is a smart player. Uh, you know, he can tackle well, and and he has that versatility. You know, if somebody like Dante Jackson or or Joey Porter Jr. gets hurt, he could kick to the outside uh, with you know, no problem. Although he he didn't have the best year last year in Detroit. And so I don't know if that's just getting used to kind of their way of doing things or, or if he just, you know, sometimes players just have down years, but it wasn't great in Detroit last year. Um, And really, if you look at the secondary as a whole now, pretty much everybody except for DeMonte KZ and Minka Fitzpatrick 
have been added within the last you know two off seasons. You got Dante Jackson added this year, Cam Sutton re-added this year, Deshaun Elliott added this year, and Joy Porter Jr. drafted last year. And then there's a you know a bunch of guys that are are new as well in terms of depth. Uh, but those kind of main six players, I did a study this morning, just kind of looking at where they ranked in the league in terms of their ball skills and their passes defense since since they entered the league and. The Steelers really are in a good spot overall with their secondary. I mean, you got Minka Fitzpatrick, who's third at his position since being drafted. Dante Jackson, 18th. Uh, Cam Sutton, 23rd. Casey, 23rd. Uh, Joey Porter Jr., 34th. But he only, you know, started his first game in week eight. And so we're talking about a secondary that went from maybe one of the kind of weaknesses of the team to it has a, a at least a chance to be a positive and a, a strength for this team. What what do you think is the weak link on the defense now? Is it still, I mean, what position and or what specific player? I honestly really like what they've done in the secondary for the on-the-field stuff. I mean, we were looking at, even just a few weeks ago, we were looking at it was Joey Porter Jr., it was Dante Jackson, and then it was Ryan Watts, Corey Trice, and Darius Rush were really all your options there. Then when they signed Anthony Everett, who solid depth piece now they have Sutton and now you I mean I think Trace can be a really good player same with Rush they, they're these contributors um but I think it's a good thing that you know these younger unproven guys are being pushed a little bit further down the depth chart now you're getting some proven vets in there so yeah like you said their ball skills in the secondary are really high right now they could be a it's very turnover heavy defense I guess uh I would say the weak link is just the defensive line depth still I mean they really didn't do they signed Dean Lowry they drafted Logan Lee but you're looking at it. I mean, Isaiah Loudermilk is he. We know what he is. Demarvin Leal. I know he thinks he's in store for a big season, and hopefully, he kind of figures things out um, now that he's got more of a defined role. I mean, even heading into last season, uh, there is still like some talk that maybe he's still going to be an outside linebacker, and so you don't really know what to prepare for for the offseason. But now that you know he's entrenched as a defensive lineman, maybe he'll be better. But that's still the area that kind of concerns me a little bit because. I mean, we saw last year how injuries at safety and how injuries at linebacker just impacted the whole defense. And so now if you know, let's say Hayward goes down again or something happens to Ogan Joby or Keanu Benton, and then you're putting in some guys that, you know, probably aren't the best on that defensive line. And I mean, trench play is so important in the AFC, especially the AFC North. So, uh, and I would have liked to see them add at least one more, you know, maybe proven commodity to come uh, be a rotational defensive lineman, but um, I think that's probably right now where I'd say their biggest weakness is, which is surprising given the state of the secondary a few weeks ago. But, I mean, credit to them for kind of adding some pretty valuable depth the way uh, they have over the last few weeks. Even Graylin Arnold is a guy who hasn't played a ton of football, but uh, he's at least an intriguing piece, and he's got some versatility too. So uh, I, I like what they've done in the secondary. Yeah. No, I, I came away fairly impressed in the Graylin Arnold film room that I did. He, uh, you know, PFF grades for take take them for what you will, but they had his run defense grade pretty low, and so I kind of went into it expecting somebody who you know was bad at tackling and you know indecisive coming downhill, and that's exactly the opposite of what I saw. That he he was good at wrapping up, uh, you know he he was not afraid to kind of you know get into the the thick of the you know pile or the offensive line or the navigating through traffic. Uh, he had a quick trigger coming downhill, and so. I think, you know, he, he could be an interesting uh, uh, addition and, and maybe what his role is. I think you posted in the Discord yesterday as well. If Sutton's suspended, Arnold's kind of that guy until Sutton's back. And then maybe you see Arnold, you know, maybe you see him end up on the practice squad or, or something like that after Sutton's able to return. Uh, or he sticks around if he plays well. And so, you know, we'll just have to wait and see there. But I did want just one player in terms of the starting 11 right now that you see as the weak link? Um, Jeter, I, it's tough to say with Dante Jackson just because we haven't seen him in the system. So I guess I would probably go with one particular guy. As it stands right now, I mean, it's probably Larry Ogunjobi, which is a little, I mean, I, I was a fan when they brought in Ogunjobi. He had a solid first year, but last year he just, yeah, he had some flashes. He had some moments where he played pretty well, but for the most part, he just wasn't really that impactful. Um, and I'm just not really sure what we're going to get out of him this year. And 
I mean, we, it, with Keanu Benton there, Keanu Benton honestly could start over and it wouldn't be a, a huge surprise, I guess, to see that happen. Um, I just think that, you know, Ogan Joby might be on, might have a short lease this season and, or entering the season at least. And um, yeah, out of the 11 guys, I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of tough, you know, going around, but the rise it stands right now, I think Ogan Joby would probably be my pick just because, um, I mean, we haven't seen Jackson in Pittsburgh. I know he had his struggles at least last season, I think the last few seasons in Carolina, but um, we'll see. Cause I mean, obviously the Steelers like him enough to go out and trade for him. So they see something in him. So yeah, I think I'm going to go and make Ogan Joby my pick there. Yeah. I was kind of thinking along the same lines, but I mean, he hasn't been very productive. He is kind of overpriced, uh, especially, I mean, what he signed three year, tw- almost $29 million contract. And so he's, he's pretty overpriced, but to have Ogan Joby as your worst, you know, your weak link on the defense, that means your defense is probably in a pretty good spot. And so I think that, you know, we're just kind of splitting hairs here, trying to figure out who the weak link is. And I think if you really narrow it down, it has to be one of either Deshaun Elliott, uh, uh Larry Ogan Joby, uh, Dante Jackson, or maybe you could throw a Landon Roberts in there. But I mean, again, we're talking about if any of those guys are your weak link, you're probably in a pretty good spot. And so, um, yeah, I'm very encouraged by the defense overall, especially now that they've added Sutton. Um, moving on to our third topic here, Minka Fitzpatrick talked about how the additions, uh, on, on defense, uh, you know, adding somebody like Peyton Wilson, adding somebody like Patrick Queen, adding a Dante Jackson, now adding Cam Sutton. These players are going to allow him to get back to playing Minka ball. And, you know, what he means by that, uh, you know, forcing his turnovers and kind of being the all pro that he's kind of perennially been since entering the league or certainly since joining the Steelers. Um, I think what what was his interception count last year? We're looking at he didn't force a single turnover in 2023. He had he had yeah. nothing. So okay, so prior to that, he had six in 2022. He had two in 2021, four in 2020, uh, five in 2019. And so yeah, I mean that's really the gist of it. He wants to get back to to making those impact plays. Uh, obviously health was part of that concern or part of the issue last year. He only ended up playing in 10 of the 17 games. Uh, and then, you know, just what was around him too. You're, you're looking at the inside linebacker group was extremely beat up. The other safeties, including Minka were also, you know, beat up. Um, you probably didn't have the best starting tandem of corners. It was really just Joey Porter jr. And, and a bunch of guys who weren't really playing up to, to, uh, you know, the level that we would have hoped. And so, yeah, now this year we're looking at a Minka Fitzpatrick who who can, you know, sit back in that center fielder role as the free safety and kind of make an impact uh, in that way. And so uh, what do you think, What what's kind of his goal for interceptions this year? Do you think he can get back to the six? Like what what, what is reasonable to expect? I think six is obviously, I mean, that's uh, that's a lot. I think it's tough to, you know, reasonably expect six, but I mean, three, four interceptions, that's certainly um, a possibility. I think last year he played, I think, 134 snaps in the slot, which is the most since his rookie season uh, in Miami when he was, you know, primarily used as a slot corner. So I think it's a little bit interesting to see now that he can kind of have more of that free safety role and um, roam a little bit more. And, you know, we have, they have guys that, you know, they have Sutton who, you know, be a slow corner. They have Patrick Queen who can cover tight ends, Peyton Wilson can cover tight ends. So I think getting him back to more of that natural, you know, free safety role is going to be something that allows him to um, kind of just get back to being Minka and having a more productive season for, I think, three, four interceptions. I'll say four interceptions are a realistic target uh, just to put a hard number on it. Uh, you've, you've seen him do it before, obviously. And I think having more of that, and obviously and he's got an upgrade next to him at safety too with the Sean Elliott. Um, Casey's obviously some solid depth too that might be playing next to him. So I think given that the pieces that added around him, I think, I think four interceptions is a, you know, pretty realistic goal. Yeah. Uh, I think the, the 2022, the Steelers were tied for the league lead in interceptions with 20, I believe. Let me just make sure i'm saying the right thing yeah they were tied for the league lead in 2022 with 20 interceptions and last season they were kind of middle of the pack 
um, or upper middle of the pack with 16, uh, which which isn't bad. But when you're considering that how beat up they were in, at safety and how Minka gave them zero interceptions, I think it's reasonable to expect them to you know approach or even maybe slightly beat that 20 number. Uh, from 2022. Now, obviously, they will be playing a lot of great quarterbacks this year, so that'll play a factor and and all that. But, um, yeah, between 16 last season, given what they had in the injury department, and then, and then, you know, 20 in 2022, I think, you know, I think we could see a lot of kind of splash plays and turnovers this year, especially given with what we were talking about with the ball skills in the secondary. And so, I'm very bullish on the defense overall. It's hard not to be at this point. Um, what? I mean, they finished seventh in points against last year. Uh, something to the tune of like 18.6 or 18.8 points per game they were allowing. And they have a real shot at being, you know, a special group this year that that far exceeds that. So I'm I'm excited. Uh, for that now a little bonus topic here that i did want to include because it's somewhat interesting uh dan graziano on get up i believe it was yesterday on wednesday uh was talking about russell wilson and justin fields kind of the played out conversation that's happened but he did mention something pretty interesting saying that russell wilson does in fact have a no trade clause in his contract um which if you really think about it, it does make a ton of sense. Signed at $1.21 million. You don't want to be a, you know, whether it's right before the season or maybe right before the trade deadline if a team has an injured quarterback and really needs a quarterback because their, their roster is otherwise very competitive. Think like the Browns last year or so, a team like that. Um, you know, the Steelers would have a huge bargaining chip uh, in that situation if he didn't have a no-trade clause because, uh, you know, you could ship him away. He's only $1.21 million to whichever team gets him. And, you know, that's very valuable to a team that is in win-now mode. And so it makes sense to have it in there. Um, I don't know if it's really going to come to matter very much because I can't see a situation where this happens. But Graziano was saying he could see, you know, there is a, a world in which Russell doesn't make it to the week one roster which i mean do you agree with that at all no absolutely not i (laughs) mean i think i think at this point it's pretty clear that the team wants him to start week one um even if he doesn't i mean i know people think oh there might be you know an attitude concern but you still need two quarterbacks um i don't know if you really i mean kyle allen fine i don't know if you really want to trust him as your number two quarterback so and even if he does in some world where Russell Wilson isn't the starting quarterback in week one, I mean, if Justin Fields struggles, then, you know, that, just as if Russell Wilson struggles, Justin Fields is going to step right in. If Justin Fields ends up having a crazy preseason and training camp and wins the job and then gets the regular season and struggles, then Russell Wilson steps right in. Um, I would be truly stunned if he was on the roster to start week one. Um, I think if anybody from ESPN is listening, just please stop talking about Russell Wilson and Justin Fields because <laughs> all, all these guys do is just talk themselves in circles, <laughs> like a, a different thing every day. And Mike Greenberg's like, oh, now I'm changing my mind. Now I'm changing my mind. Now I'm changing my mind based off like what everybody says. And oh, it's so, it's just so frustrating to listen to. So, <laughs> you know, may, maybe nix the topic for at least a week because for my sanity, I can't listen to you talk about it anymore. Um, but yeah, no, Russell Wilson will be on the roster to start week one. Yeah, yeah, it is getting tiring, and I know, you know, readers, just like we are, we're, we're tired of it. We know you guys are tired of it, but, you know, it's it's uh, unfortunately the biggest story of the NFL offseason in, in some people's eyes, and so I don't think it's going away anytime soon, and it'll probably ramp up even more in training camp, so prepare yourselves. Um, all right, we're going to move into our listener question and then close out the show. This is from a Brett Dial, I believe, calling from what looks like Texas area code. We'll play the question. Uh, yes. Uh, hello, Depot Dive. My name is Brett Dial, and I had a question and maybe comment um, about the future of the defensive line position. Um, the comment is that this team, I think, made a mistake in its approach to Javon Hargrave, and I'm afraid they're going to repeat the same mistake with Keanu Benson. The mistake with Hargrave was they insisted on playing him exclusively at nose tackle, even though he was an impact player. Subsequently, when um, 
injuries forced it in his final season, and they moved him to defensive end. He provided actually probably more impact than the player he replaced. Are we going to see the same thing with Benton, where the insistence on playing him at nose tackle, just because that was a convenient place to start him, keeps them from using him, especially in sub-package, to rush the passer as a defensive end? Long term, this team will need someone like Keanu Benton at defensive end. In my opinion, they should start laying the groundwork for that now. It would be a lot easier to replace a nose tackle than find another defensive end as good as Benton can be. Thank you very much for the comment. Thank you. All right, that was Brett Dial. Thank you for calling in. And anybody who wants to leave a question like Brett just did, call the number at the bottom of the screen, 412-254-3145. Leave us a voicemail for a chance to have your question answered on a future episode. And his question was basically boiled down to, should the Steelers get Keanu Benton more involved on the outside in terms of defensive end? Uh, Last season, about 90% of his snaps were either nose or defensive tackle playing on the interior. And, you know, on on pass rush downs, uh, that that ends up kind of maybe taking you off the field in some certain situations. I want to say he played roughly half of the Steelers' defensive snaps. Let me verify that. But that sounds about right. Yeah, he played 43% of the Steelers' defensive snaps. And you got to keep in mind that's in a season where Cameron Hayward missed a bunch of time at the beginning, and he kind of had to step in probably earlier than they, they probably intended. But do you think we see Benton more on the outside? Do you think they're going down a similar path uh, to what they went down with Javon Hargrave, where they kind of only utilized him inside for the most part and uh, you know maybe missed out on some opportunities to maximize his impact on the team? Um, I wouldn't be surprised if they moved Benton around a little bit, but I mean, he is really good on the inside. I, I know Alex put together a video a couple of months ago. I think it might have even been during the season of, you know, I think, I mean, Benton only had what one, one and a half sack last season. Um, but he missed probably five or six by like milliseconds. So it's on as if I don't, I don't necessarily know that playing on the inside is kind of wasting some of his ability. I think, you know, as he, refines his game more and grows that we'll see him kind of really excel on the inside but yeah I mean they could definitely kick him outside more as he develops more I mean Javon Hargraves last season in Pittsburgh I think he had 86 snaps uh over tackle which is the second highest of his career uh Ben only had 18 last year which is less than Hargrave had as a rookie Hargrave at 55 as a rookie um so um yeah I mean I could see I could see that role kind of expanding as the years go on I don't necessarily think this season there's going to be, you know, a huge focus on getting him outside and over tackle again, uh, you know, kind of play DN, but um, we'll see. I mean, we'll see how he develops. I think, I think he's great as an interior guy. And I think he could, he could be solid on the end as well and just kind of, you know, move him around and be a little versatile. Um, It's definitely a possibility. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. I think, you know, interior is where they're going to keep him for now. Um, But, you know, he does have, long almost 34 inch arms he's maybe a little little short but the arm length's more important he's 6036 309 pounds at least coming out of the draft he was he's probably changed a little bit uh, since then but um yeah i think keeping him in the interior and i mean brett you're 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 preaching to the choir uh i also agree and i think everybody i think joe probably also does that the steelers need to immediately uh next season find a long-term solution at defensive end um you know i don't know if benton's going to be a part of that plan he's pretty good in 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 the middle maybe maybe they use him a little bit especially as they're bringing a rookie along whoever they might end up drafting but yeah they need to find a long-term solution asap because that is uh i mean it's one of the most important positions on the defense freeing up the outside linebackers freeing up you know linebackers in general and eating up the run. I mean, it is very important. So you're, uh, you're, we're definitely in agreement with you there, Brett. All right. Well, that's everything for the show today. We're going to wrap up here. Thank you guys for tuning in. Please, uh, if you're watching on YouTube, like this video, subscribe to the channel. We have content every day for you guys. Um, that is all for today and we will catch you next time.